Hey everyone, I think, I don't know whether this is on or just shouting. There are a few more seats knocking about, so feel free to take a seat. Um, my name is Anthony Osho. I'm one of the co-founders of Love at First Vibe. We are like a small collective of like friends and brothers who throw parties, uh, have a podcast and host panel discussions like this. And basically we like thought about this panel discussion for a couple of reasons. It's always getting off in our WhatsApp group anytime like Kanye or Wiley goes on a big rant about something or when we're trying to find out on every social media platform when Frank Ocean is going to release some new music. So like, we're always talking about social media and it's having such a huge impact on the music industry that we're like, you know, it might be good to get some people who are probably more well informed than we are to talk about it. Um, so that's what we've got today. I'll introduce the panel and then I'll like kick off. I will try my best to like, properly moderate and not like get too involved, despite being very passionate about it. So I got, I got some smoke for people on the panel. <laughs> um, so first up, we've got Jordan Wi-Fi. Hello, everyone. Hello, 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 hello. Jordan, <laughs> Jordan is the, uh, one of the founding members of Last Night in Paris. If you don't know Last Night in Paris, they're a really cool hip hop collective, but they're also Thank doing you. everything from fashion to photography to film. Uh, you should be checking them out if you don't know them already. Next up, we've got Tasha Demi. Tasha is a music marketing manager at RCA Records. So Tasha has worked across lots of urban music, supporting people like Stefflon Don, Wretch32 on their album and single releases. So huge wealth of experience there. Followed by Rian Jones. And I always say Rihanna, and I don't know why. I'm just a bit weird like that. Rian Jones uh, is a freelance journalist. Her work's been published in The Independent, The Guardian, Music World Business. And she's also currently writing a book, well, a self-help guide for musicians uh, in the modern day. So it'll be interesting to hear what some of those views in terms of self-help for social media are. Last and not but last and not but least, last and not but least uh, is Darren Sequera. Am I pronouncing that right? Like it, yeah. Oh yeah, I got got a bit of that Spanish, got a bit of that Spanish pizzazz. I'm going to sit down because it's hella hot. Um, so Darren is head of music, uh, head of entertainment at Facebook. So he works with. Um, some of the biggest studios, whether it's Disney, whether it's Warner, and also helps with some of the biggest labels from Universal and kind of developing their strategy and how they navigate their way through social media. So that's the panel. If everyone gives them a quick round of applause. Um, so we've got quite a diverse audience in terms of people like from the music industry, some who don't know anything about it. So I thought the first place to start, or a good place to start, is just Tasha to get a bit of an understanding of what the process looks like, you know, a new artist lands on your lap. What do you do from a social media or from a marketing manager's perspective? Hi guys. Um, okay, so I work at RCA um, and my job is a market manager at a major record label. Obviously I can only speak from that side. Um, there's two sides of the story. You've got the market inside and then you have the a &R side. So the a &R side will look after the music. So what does that artist sound like? What are we releasing? Who should they be working with? What do we need to work on? Do they need to develop anything? Um, and then they deliver me the music. Once I have the music, it's then my job to work with all the other teams that includes the promotion teams, digital teams, et cetera. And I create the whole brand, the whole story around the eyes. So who they are, what we want to be putting out to the world, when we want to put it out to the world, um, what social media platforms should we be using, um, what time of year should we be releasing, what the videos would look like, what your artwork looks like, what your social handle should be. So basically everything apart from the music kind of comes down to the other side of marketing. And then all the teams kind of relook back into us. Um, and after a lot of work, you eventually hear some music. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Darren, where, where did Facebook come into this? Because I know that there's an element of you provide the platform but there's a little bit more than that. And I know this because I did a little bit of research. So I wanted to see if you could explain that bit. Uh, yeah, so our roles are working closely with the label uh, and sometimes directly with the artists and their teams. Um, really, our job is to, uh, Facebook and Instagram particularly, uh, as two platforms, are just evolving really rapidly. Um, <clears throat> almost, you know, kind of more rapidly than even we at Facebook and Instagram can keep up with because, um, you know, artists such as Jordan, you know, kind of pushing the boundaries and really experimenting on the platform. So, um, so you know, we've got kind of core recommendations that we'll sort of bring to the table uh, and advise, um, you know, the major labels that these are things that you should be 
be thinking about for kind of all your artists. Uh, and then there's the kind of the nuance to the specific artists um, and specific launches that they're doing where we might go a bit deeper and sort of, you know, really kind of get under the skin of, okay, you know, what does this artist want to achieve? Is it their, you know, their first single launch? Is it their first album? Um, can we bring <coughs> something more to the table? that can really kind of blow that up and make it, you know, stand out, cut through versus the, you know, the many, many artists that are out there. And, you know, and I look after, as you said, um, you know, the rest of entertainment as well. And it's just a, a huge amount of noise, you know, entertainment volume of content that is coming at all of your, um, you know, and the audiences out there is just huge. So really the question that we seek to answer a lot of the time is how do we cut through? Jordan, what does that sound like? I'm just wondering, like, you've you got an artist who's on a label, they're getting support from the label, they're getting support from Facebook, from the platform. You guys are pretty self-sufficient. Like, is that, is, do you think that's it's, fair? How do, what is that? It's sound? weird because I feel like there's a lot of different artists out there. Some people need that label support. Some people literally can't actually have it because once they have it, they almost implode because they're so used to doing everything themselves. Mm. You know what I mean? So it's almost... A double-edged sword. Some arts will work, some arts won't. But I feel like it's very interesting. How how are you guys using it from a last night in Paris perspective? Then using Facebook or just social media in general, and what um, platforms are you using? I guess I feel like mainly Instagram. Everybody knows Instagram's probably the one. Facebook obviously owns Instagram, but <laughs> 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 you know, what I mean, Facebook are cool. Yeah, thank, um, thank you, thank you, Jordan. So thank you, Jordan. <laughs> We use Facebook well too, we got a Facebook page, follow us on Facebook. Um, yeah, we use Instagram a lot mm. and I feel like it's amazing because it connects you directly with your audience. Mm. It gives you the ability to bypass like maybe what people had to do in the past where they had to have money, they had to have resources to be able to connect with people. Mm. So it's like a main tool in our everyday use. It's our main tool to connect us to our fans, so yeah. So Rian, do you think you... Just to bring you in, do you, do you think you have to be on social media to be a successful artist? Like, it sounds like everyone's got a role to play on this stage in terms of social media and being, being a musician. Do you, do you think you have to be online? I think it's a really useful tool um, to access your fan base and get your music out there to the world. And I mean, the primary way that young people will find new music is online, whether mm. that's YouTube or Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever. So it's pretty important to have a presence on those platforms. Mm. Um, but the most important thing is always to focus on getting really good at making good music and playing live, because that's the thing that's gonna ensure that you have a long and successful career and social media is just, it's something that can help facilitate that, but it's not the thing that's gonna, yeah, yeah bring longevity. I would say, that's like the realistic thing that we all want, but re in the reality of it, mm. there's people that don't have good music. That can we? Can you I'm name some? Honest, can I'm we? Honest. Can we name some? I'm not naming any. <laughs> names. I'm not naming any names. But we all know there's people that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you guys can name names. But <laughs> they're, they're no heckling, no. Yeah, yeah. There, there are people that don't have good music. They don't perform great, but they have the right label backing them. They have the right social media guy at Facebook that they know, plugging them on all the songs or they have the, the you know what I mean? There's but are they going to be around in 10 years time? We don't know because some of them are. Some of them are still alive. <laughs> <laughs> like, am I wrong? I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong. <laughs> some, of them, some of them you think, oh, they're not going to be around and they're around. They're really still here. And you're like, how are you still here? But It, it depends what you want from your career. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, it, of course. Ultimately. I think there's so many different types of artists now and there's so many different journeys you can take. When I first started in music, it was all about getting number one. I want to be the top of the chart. That was it. It's all you ever worked towards. How do we get the song at the top of the iTunes chart? How do we keep getting people to hear it? We have to be number one. Now, you can be an artist, a successful artist, in so many different ways and not chart at all. You can just have a really good touring um, life. You can have a really good merch line. You can have a whole other kind of lane to your career. You could be a presenter or a footballer or an entertainment person or whatever it is. And I think that's the special thing about it now. And do you think social media feeds that then? Like, yeah. in order to be successful in all those guises, I, I guess what I'm pushing is, does you, do you have to have a presence? And I guess it, my follow-up question would be, what should that presence look like? You know, you've got this idea of being authentic and everyone says, you know, be yourself, be yourself online. But the reality for most of us, it probably doesn't look like that. So when 
I guess a question for you, Tasha. Yeah, I, I, what do you feel about this question of authenticity? What are you telling your artists that you're managing? I think the key thing for me is as social media is so incredibly important, I think, because it, you can reach the masses. You can reach people in Australia without getting on a plane. However, if you don't exist in the real world, you can't exist online. So you have to make sure that whatever brand you're putting out online actually is you in the real world and you're actually doing that stuff. You're not faking it. You're actually going out and meeting people. You're actually performing, connecting with your fans. Because if that isn't true, then nothing will work. But I feel like there are a lot of people yeah. that's not true, but they're still relying on the internet and social media and their caught online fan base to kind of live the life that they portray. You know what I mean? And I feel like a lot of people have, a, even if it's a small percent mm. percentage of that, because you can put on online or on your Facebook or on Instagram every time you're having a good day. Every time you're having a bad day or it's not working out for you or it's not going your way, you people don't see that. that yeah. So you're always kind of showing the world... The best version of the, yourself. The best you, you know what I mean? The highlighted you, like the, the me on my oh, best day. You, know you I mean? on job. <laughs> me on job. So, so Darren, like... Uh, from a Facebook, Instagram perspective, like what is what I hate. I hate this phrase. I'm going to say it anyway. What does good look like? Who's doing it right now? Like who's got who's executing social yeah, I mean, media I th well I think for their career? Incidentally, on this um, question of authenticity, I think um, you know a lot. A lot's kind of written in the press, and we can kind of look at social media as kind of like the driving force behind some of that negativity. But if you think about it, you know, there's been shit music since before social media. There's been inauthentic artists, you know, that you know aren't dead yet, you know what I mean? Or you know, their, music, their, their music hasn't gone away, you know? So um, uh, what, in, in my view, you know, social media is, just reflects what we see and sometimes amplifies what we see in the real world. Mm. Um, so, and, and sometimes can amplify some of that, uh, that negative stuff that we, you know, that we want to iron out. So that, that's sort of, um, I guess, a bit of a, just a point around sort of authenticity. As far as who's doing it well, um, I wish I was intelligent enough to have come up with this, but we work with a team internally called the Creative Shop, uh, and they're they're um, from the ad, from the ad business. They're creative directors, super creative people that we work with just to kind of make um, you know the campaigns, whether it's music, movie, or any other category, as best as it can be creatively, um, trying to keep up with you know Jordan and you know what what sort of some of the young artists are doing, um, and um, uh, and so and they they came up with they, they sort of packaged what um, they believe is working really well on our platforms, and they called it intertextuality. It's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, and really what that means is, um, so it's about when you see artists or anyone publishing on uh, social media, uh, it's about recognising the sophistication of the audience, that there is so much entertainment and just general content coming at them, and it's about picking um, different contrasting strands of content, sort of throwing those together. You, I kind of call it more simply sort of, if you think of mashups, it's like mashups 2.0. So does anyone follow uh, Little Nuz? For example, so Little Nas, I mean, there's a number of different examples of this, but I just feel that he's just having a moment. And if you look at how he posts on the subject of authenticity, he'll post, you know, from stage, kind of stage experiences with major artists. But he'll also post sort of day to day from his home. But he does he does a great strand of intertextuality. Um, he did like a really just a really sort of deadpan sort of take off of the of the Drake album. You know, it was just kind of deadpan. And all his fans were kind of just taking the piss that, you know, that, that he was just taking that out. You know, he was just copying it but he was doing it sort of you know totally in a self-aware way and um, just recently he did this i think celebrating 14 weeks at number one with old time with old, old town road um big it, tune by the way it, uh, yeah good tune <laughs> We like that tune, um, and uh, and it's done so well. So to celebrate that, he's done sort of the quintessential intertextuality sort of bit of content, which is this kind of mashup, and it includes sort of um, like Red or Dead Redemption, like the get the, the cowboy game, to um, um, user generated content of people riding horses in crazy ways, to even like Toy Story Four, to like Woody from Toy Story Four kind of thing, um, and he's thrown all that together in a way that's totally relevant to him and his kind of you know quite young fan base. Um, that that is the way at the moment I think to kind of to win, you know. On um, that, that's what good looks like to us at the moment for artists. So is what you say important? I'm just wondering then, from like having a social media profile and the message you put out versus, Rian, to your point, the music you put out. Should we be looking at you know an artist that we really like the music of to mirror and have a I guess a persona that we respect, or or are those two things completely detached? 
uh, I've just asked. Uh, I'll open it um, on the floor. I feel like it's one of those things where it's almost either or. Like there's some artists that have amazing music and that speaks for itself and that carries them. They don't need to be that persona all the, all the time. And then there's some artists that have like a niche, like mm. Nas, Little Nas X. What I heard is he originally started as like a meme page. Mm -hmm. So he's like plugged into that internet world of this is funny. When this happens, this is the joke you use. A stockpile of meme pictures that will get people retweeting and reblogging. Mm. So that's, I feel like it's important. It is important. But to, to be married up, because I, I wonder for an example with like, I don't know, a divisive character like Kanye West, or you'd look at an Iggy Azalea and an Azalea Banks, you know, their music and then their social profile. Could, I guess what I'm asking is, does your social profile, can it discredit your music in any way? And what, yeah, it'd be good to know from a label perspective, do, are there any do's and don'ts <laughs> from an art? For be an art? nice, don't argue with fans. That's always the best one. <laughs> um, I, think, I think we all know examples of when celebrities or musicians have kind of done something online and then the label is running around going, oh my God, what do we do? Do we need to stop this? Do we need to delete this? Blah, blah, blah. But then by that point, it's already out to the world. And when it's on the internet, it's there forever. Um, you can't help that. Mm. Like, I think as a label, we can only do what we can do and advise on these things. But at the end of the day, when Kanye wants to tweet about going to mountains and doing whatever he's doing, Kanye will do that. And I think someone like Kanye West as well, he existed obviously before social media and all of that. I think now it can be a little bit more detrimental for artists that are coming up through this social media world and like their careers launched because of that. Um, I'm working with an artist at the moment called H. I don't know if anyone's familiar. He's a rapper from Manchester. Uh, we signed him about a year ago when I first started uh, RCA. When we signed him, he released a freestyle on his own YouTube channel, um, completely out of the blue, and it hit a million views within two weeks. That was just kind of a real example of just the internet doing what it does. Sometimes things kind of get picked up and get taken. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, so we signed him. He had 8,000 followers, and he's now on over half a million followers. In do just do you look at followers before you sign someone? No. Like like, so that was never an issue for us. But over the last year, he's not released a lot of music, but there's been a lot of activity on his page. And he's been, he's a really, really good example of someone that uses social media so naturally in his day-to-day -day world. So you're literally on his journey with him every day. As mm. he wakes up, he will talk to his fans on Instagram. As he goes to sleep, he will do the same. So over the last year, they've all completely been able to get to know him. The good, the bad, the ugly, the drunk side of him, the sober side, the bit on stage, the bit in the studio. And now we're going up to release his music. I feel like his fans are in such an exciting spot because they actually just really like him now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Rian, is, I just wonder, is that dangerous that, you know, so much of yourself is out there and you have to put yourself out there? Uh, is, is there a risk that, you know, if things change and people don't like you? Like, I don't know. What, what's your view on that? I think it's a, a risk that a lot of people are willing to take mm. to get to where they need to be. Because sometimes for your audience to invest in you, you have to invest like yourself in them. You know what I mean? You have to kind of take that shell away and go, this is me, this is the real me, this is what I do every day. This is how I get by. Will you support me on my journey? You know what I mean? So I think it could be detrimental, but realistically, if you're in the game to be, yeah, build, yeah, and, build yeah. and be worldwide and have everybody buy into your music and your mm. sound, you have to give a part of you to them you have to sacrifice like you you know what i mean almost um Rian, i'm definitely coming to you for this because you're writing the self-help book Wh what are if any like what are the risks to doing that that feels um, you know you kind of become a public figure where the fans who actually don't know you are expecting you to behave and be a certain person yeah and then criticism is taken very personally because you feel like it's a critique of you as a person rather mm. than your work and your artist and your persona um the advice generally which doesn't come from me personally but people i've spoken to for the book like healthcare professionals is um if your artist persona is very intrinsically tied to who you are as a person um which i think more often than not is the case then share your work, share, so what you're promoting, what you're selling, your music, your live tickets, um, share, you know, things about you and your artist persona and the two things, um, how the two things kind of 
exist together mm. and the world in which you're operating. So people that you're with and the scene and whatever it might be and any causes that you want to align yourself with. Um, and don't go beyond that. So just don't share things that like you wouldn't be happy you know, going to a room full of strangers and shouting out and, you know, something that your mum might read, like, mm. just really think before posting. I think it's very easy to sit behind a computer or behind your phone and just quickly send something out without realising it's going out to the world. And But the world demands it, doesn't it? As as fans and as music listeners, audiences, we we expect that. So there's a feels like there's a, there's a tension now, I don't know. Yeah, but I don't think they expect, like people don't expect you to tweet like your personal feelings or like maybe a, you know, a point of view that you might have on something that might alienate mm. people or something about something that's going on in your personal life. Those kind of things I think is best kept offline mm. and in your close circle of friends and family. Mm. Yeah, I feel like I agree with you, but that's not how it is, if you know what I mean. I feel like fans wanna hear what you think. If something happens today, and you have a million fans, they want to know what your opinion of that is. They want, like, fans these days and music listeners and supporters are heavily invested. They wake up and they want to know what their favourite artist thinks about that topic. And that that might shape their opinion, you know what I mean? So mm. if you've got an artist that every day avoids the topics, they don't want to talk about it, like, we're very mysterious, we don't really share. Yeah, that's you, that's yeah. your that's almost your persona, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's, perso that's our persona, but mm. that's because I agree with what you're saying. I don't feel like I want to give myself to the world that much yet because I need to live my life. You know what I mean? Mm. I have things that I... You want to have yeah. a separation. I don't want to tell you guys every day how I feel about this. I don't want to have to always do that. Mm. But some people and most fans want that. Most fans need that to... You know what I mean? Yeah. Le then leave them wanting. Yeah. That's, That's a really great position to be in. Like, retain some mystery. People will always be wanting to hear more. But then you have the people like Stormzy who are so opinionated and they give themselves to their public and the fans really buy into them because it's authentic. He shares a lot of opinions as the masses do. He's coming from a place that doesn't have a voice. So when you get to somewhere so high and you people where you're from don't have a voice, you've got to give that voice. You've got to talk and give yeah. share that opinion of mm. where you're from. Yeah, you know that's I mean? why it's like align yourself with some causes. Great, like yeah. definitely do that. Things that you really believe in and that are going to help people. But Stormzy is pretty quiet online. Like, and he completely switched off while he was in the lead up to his Glastonbury and while he's yeah. making his second album. He doesn't. He doesn't feed the beast. He really but like has a selective approach. I feel like that's Stormzy at the top. Stormzy going to the top or on his way to where he is now. Mm. He was very vocal. He was very. He spoke about political issues. He spoke about day-to-day -day things. He spoke about Love Island, where most artists wouldn't even say, I, I watched that. You know what I mean? He was... Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Not to say. Yeah. Yeah. No, of course, of course, of course. Of course, of course, of course. No, of course, I, I agree with you, I agree with you. No, but definitely, I definitely. I want to... I want to... <laughs> no, my girl's there. I, wa I, wa I want to... I Shout out to the wife. <laughs> <laughs> how, how are you going to drop him in there like that? You can't mention yeah. man's girl like that. <laughs> uh, wait till the end for questions. You can't do stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Uh, I want to I want to bring it back around to probably a, an area that is quite linked to that element of you know taking a break from social media. I, I guess it's something that we're all being tasked with today. But from a musician's perspective, Darren, do, do, do Facebook what what role do you guys have to play in you know it, some of the challenges that people are facing or artists are facing on on being online? Yeah, we were talking about about it a little bit earlier. So um, there's this kind of really 
unsexy term. Sounds a bit like a disease called MSI. You might have, <laughs> you might have read about it <laughs> but if, if you're kind of in the business a little bit, but um, it's not a disease. Um, uh, and it's a term that we, uh, one of the many acronyms that we have at Facebook. Um, and, uh, and it refers to meaningful social interaction. So uh, you, what you might have seen in the press sort of about a year, year and a half ago um, was that you, you know all the numbers, the usership, the time spent, um, that was all just, you know, just kind of skyrocketing, increasing on both Facebook, Facebook and Instagram. You know, great for us, great for Wall Street, all that stuff, right? Um, and then as we're constantly looking at the behavior on the platform and indeed, you know, some of the negative experiences that people have, um, what we realized was that the type of interaction had cha changed. In fact, actually interaction had gone down significantly from when like, I first started at the company 11 years ago. And we realized that that was the sort of, that's the kind of core, um, that's the, you know, the, the magic kind of source that sort of makes this whole thing. What, what do you mean by interaction? So, so what we were seeing was that people were um, going through feed and then stories, um, but it's primarily feed, Instagram and Facebook, and not interacting. So they, they were they were looking at content, they were watching video. It sort of it kind of correlated with the proliferation of video. So I remember Ice Bucket Challenge. It was a huge, it was like a trebling, like overnight of the amount of video that was uploaded, and so people became passive viewers. Um, and then um, that that also meant sort of negative content, content that you know sort of um, whether it's from you know news providers or whether it's from you know user generated stuff that's just 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 negative and not great people were um were consuming a lot more content and of, of varied quality and having kind of essentially a worse time on the platform even though the numbers were telling us the platform was doing well right and that kind of correlated with some of the mental health issues etc that we started to discuss um with government uh, and with the various bodies that are out there so um, we realized that there was a there was a factor that we could improve um, meaningful social interactions um, was the way in which the engineering team were able to change the algorithm uh, and favor that type of content and in layman's terms really it just meant content um, that generated positive interaction between friends and family on Facebook, um, between friends and passion points on Instagram was favored in the algorithm. Um, and we saw quite a significant dip in time spent on the platform that kind of scared people that watch that kind of thing, uh, scared perhaps some of our advertisers, but we mm. knew it was the right thing to, to do, do for the quality of experience on the platform. And a year and a half later, um, we've got you know increases in usership still and also um, engagement, yeah. you know, and, and the quality of people's experience. You know, that job will never be done. You know, look, pick up, the, pick up a, you know, uh, the, the press any day and you'll see negative aspects to our platform. However, that was one of the most significant things we did over the last year and a half to really um, improve people's experience. Yeah, that, and, and that's an interesting one because I wonder what that, uh, I don't know whether anyone on the panel has had experience or spoken to artists that have had that negative interaction on their on their page or felt pressured from the page. You, you imagine as an artist, you might release an album, maybe it's not what you expect. I think, you know, some of the reception to Skepta's latest album, for example, like how, how as an artist, should you be hiding yourself away from that or do you have to brunt it? What, what, what yeah, open question really. Um, I'll just, yeah, I'll go for it. Um, I feel like there's always going to be negative people in no matter what you do. Mm. And like you were saying, these days, people have almost like a tribe-like audience. They have their core fans. So people can dislike what you do, but you have people that are there for that. And not everything you do is going to be a hit. Not everything you do is going to be great. How do you How do you feel when you see it, though? As in, like, you know, maybe... But me, the, the post didn't get as many likes as you wanted, or you know, it didn't get the song me, didn't get as many streams. Me How was that? Yeah. I feel like it can't ever stop me because the moment the negativity makes me slow down, mm. that's when it's gotten to me and I'm defeated. Because realistically, it's just about consistency. Mm. Most artists you love, you don't remember what they did Excellent. like three months and yeah. four days ago. You remember all the great things or everything they've done, the disc, mm. like their their catalog that you love. That's what you remember. So if you keep on going and keep consistent, mm. you will build favorite songs. You'll build like I like them because of this. They may do that that I don't like, but I still follow them because that's what I like. I might not like that. I like that. I might not like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and Tasha, from a marketing perspective, I'm wondering whether th there are times where an artist is going through a period of like maybe less e less engagement, for example, as as Darren said. What? How do you manage them through that? Because, you know, if you've got an artist like H who's come up in this era, like addicted to the phone, he gets huge stardom very quickly. What do what happens in those low points? 
I think it's really hard. I think for artists and I think for everyone else in this room would probably either have experienced it or mm, for sure. have had someone experience it. When you put a picture up on Instagram and it gets three likes and then you're like, oh my God, I'm going to delete it. I'm going to upload it again at 7am tomorrow morning. Like <laughs> the amount of people that do that or they completely just delete their whole feed because they haven't had enough likes or comments. or. And I think it's awful and it's so... Like everyone is just watching numbers all the time. Mm. Um, but then a lot of that time... It, I feel it's because I feel like quality, con quality control has gone down. So much is kind of out so often and so quickly now mm. that you can put something out. Like, I'm sure if you release a song today, someone tomorrow is going to ask you when your next release is. Yeah. Like, it's literally, just over. Literally. Um, I've, I've literally done that three times to Jordan tonight. Yeah. But well, <laughs> <go>. <laughs> like, literally, like, when is it coming? <laughs> so I feel like for me, if, from a label side, my whole thing for them is just how do we create strong content for you mm. and how do we keep continuing to make sure that what you're putting out to the world is good and then like Jordan said you you will become you will build a fan base that does stick by you and I mean everyone's had a bad album I'm sure Kanye's had a bad album but then his fans will still stick by him mm. but I think if as long as you just keep putting out your authentic self I know that's really cringy to say but keep kind of being true to yourself putting out content that you like mm eventually your kind of engagement will just grow naturally because you'll be attracting the right type of fans that actually do just like you. But does that work in, in the label world or in the music industry where, you know, actually you guys are investing in these artists? Like I, I would say maybe from a, a, a question, from an independent perspective, you can just do that. But with a label, I guess what measures, what targets, are there measures and targets that you need to get to? No, I mean, it's not as simple as if you don't hit a thousand followers, we're going to drop you. It does, it's not, it's more, okay, we very realistically look at the engagement of your stuff today on a Wednesday. Mm. And then we'll say, okay, cool. So by September, we hope to have got to this point. How do we think we get to this point? Okay, so what's working so far in your social media profile? So we find that actually posting videos does kind of get you a good few followers and actually posting pictures of your food doesn't. So we're gonna up your video content. Or then some artists find that posting posy pictures of themselves and dresses going out gets them way more likes than their music video. But then obviously we're still promoting a music artist. So then we have to now figure out a way to talk to the fans and get the fans to like mm. the music more than just the picture of the girl in a dress. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I so we have to really like look at every kind of detail and just see what reaction each one's getting and just be Rian, quite proactive do, with it. Rian, how does that sound to you? Does it, does it, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm interested to know what your view on it is in terms of this kind of almost manufacturing of of the artist. Um, yeah, that's a tricky one. The, the thing that I was interested in that you're talking about was the nature of criticism and dealing with negativity online, mm. which is something that I can talk about. Um, well, you talk about it. Yes. <laughs> so... Um, Number one, I think the thing to remember is that fans can be really fickle and they might not like you going in a new direction and they might critique that and that's not necessarily a reflection of the quality of your work. Mm. Um, but something that Marianne Hobbs said, which I thought was really interesting when it comes to criticism, was like it's really important to really analyze where it's coming from because the criticism from people who want you to win is important to listen to. And that's mm. not necessarily fans. It's like, you know, people who know and love you. Um, constructive criticism. And the criticism of strangers or people who don't really care, that's not really important to listen to. And that will come mm. like from various different sources throughout the course of your career. You can't please everyone. And actually, if you're doing something progressive, you will divide people. Mm. Um, but yeah, so it's just to analyze like where it's coming from and then forget about it and move on or take it on as something constructive if it's from someone who wants you to win. Yeah, I think, I think that's good advice to, to probably to all of us in, yep. in every guys. Um, I want to move us on a, a little bit more. And uh, you mentioned data, uh, which I thought was a really interesting point, Tasha. Um, and pull up an example of like, I think music being integrated into your social media post and sharing music on the post. I think of a great example is Kodak Black's ZZ where he had that little short trailer and the internet literally went completely viral waiting for this song. Do, does that sort of stuff work? Darren, I don't know, or Tasha, if there's, you know, teasing music and putting music on your, as a post, would that work for an artist or is yeah. it? Yeah, um, 
I think it does. I mean, every artist is different, but um, I think it definitely does. Um, I worked with Rams on Barkin. Don't know if anyone knows that song. Um, but so he released the track on GRM Daily, just mm. put a video up online and it wasn't anywhere else. It wasn't on any DSPs anywhere because he just put the song online. Didn't really get kind of how it all worked. Um, and then Polydor, my old label, picked it up. And in the process of us kind of signing the track, getting all the assets in, delivering the track to the platforms to make sure it's available on Spotify and the Apples, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, that takes a minute. So in that process, we then kind of looked at every, like, I guess 70% of the comments on the YouTube video was, where is this video on um, Spotify? I can't find the video on iTunes. I can't find the, um, the song to listen to. So we made assets out of those YouTube comments and started serving those as ads to oh, people, okay. kind of just in that community. So then everyone's going, huh? Like, what, what is this? And then, like, we made a video of, um, like, a cartoon of, like, Rams at a train station, kind of, and then it's like, the train to bark in, we'll be arriving in. And just kind of took it really silly, because that's mm. the route that he wanted to go in. And again, started serving it out to his fans. So then his fans even more were like, what's going on here? And you kind of just feel the energy and the engagement kind of go up and up from there. Mm. So when the song was unavailable, everyone was like, ah, was okay, it made sense. Yeah. On. I think teaser campaigns are always really good. Obviously, it has to make sense for the artist. Nothing ever goes out that they're not a part of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Darren, have you got any? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, the the teaser trailer, if you like, coming out of coming out of music for a second, the movie industry do this really well. Mm. Um, they'll, yeah, you know, they'll they'll tease content. They'll tease uh, the imminent launch of a trailer. Um, they'll use their talent to do that. Um, if anyone saw the Avengers movie, you might have picked up on the talent kind of all dropping the one sheet poster at the same time on Instagram, which just kind of blew up across Instagram, just took it over for a day for free, incidentally. Uh, they, you know, they, they just had a highly coordinated approach with the Disney marketing team. Um, so I think, um, I think music artists have that same opportunity. You don't perhaps sort of see it as much. I mean, Tasha Ray is a really, you know, prime example of when you, when you do it well mm. you can really excite the audience um you know don't forget instagram audiences facebook audiences are there pretty much every day like most people are coming back every day give or take certainly the younger demographics are definitely there every day um so there is an opportunity to pick a moment um you know within the life cycle of an artist developing a new single or an album um and really excite that audience and sort of tease them you know we talk quite a bit about being in the studio so it's you know it's really exciting to um if you don't really know or storms is gone quiet or you know you just don't know what an artist is up to um then to sort of to have you know to yes have a bit of a gap in that communication on social media but then have a moment um that just suggests something you know they're they're back in the studio or you know the next single is is, is kind of imminently coming um those types of teases you know can work really well because the audience is on the platform every single day kind of as you say hungry for for yeah, that type of information so to rianne's point you know kind of let, you know, keeping them wanting more. I mean, that's that's surely one of the things that we've you know always done in entertainment marketing. We should probably do a bit more of on social media. Do Do you think we could ever end up in a world where you like releasing songs on social media? It's an open question to everyone. I just I just wonder with so much engagement on these platforms, we live on these things. Like, would you? Could we end up in that world? Yeah, I feel like we're there. You know what I mean? Mm. I feel like we are there. I feel like content's digested so quickly and songs are getting smaller yeah there used to be a time where songs are five minutes now songs are like one and a half minutes two minutes <laughs> you know what i mean so i feel like people go to people might just stay on just instagram you know mm. what i mean so if they develop a streaming service in the app that you can listen to songs while scrolling i'm sure everybody would would do that you know what i mean careful jordan yeah Get careful <laughs> Careful, I, careful, 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 you're mic'd up. Can you're I, mic'd up. That's not from Apple or Spotify in the room, is it? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, um, yes. <laughs> don't listen to me, don't listen to me. No, but I mean, um, so I'm, I'm making a bit of a gag out of it because, you know, sometimes those companies can be a bit difficult to work with. Sometimes we can be difficult to work with. But you're absolutely right. We, we talk about it quite a lot uh, around friction. So, uh, so there's a trend that we see, uh, and it makes just kind of intuitive sense that any friction in our lives... Um, now, in particularly with young audiences coming through that have an expectation around the speed with which they can do things on their mobile, online, any friction and people have dropped off, right? As we talk about this in kind of all industries, um, I, I use an adage, if anyone uses Uber, probably most people in the room, if you remember sort of about three or four years ago, um, five years ago, maybe you'd, you know, you'd, you'd book a cab 
with 24 hours to go, you know, and that would be an acceptable amount of time. Um, Uber are one of our clients, the rest of my, my colleagues look after them and they tell us that, um, you know, they've got data that if anyone, uh, if anyone gets a, a ride time that's, you know, a wait of over five minutes, they've got like a 90% drop off. So we've gone from 24 hours to five minutes in our expectation of that particular industry, right? It's just sort of outside of our industry. Um, just to, to bring to life the expectation that we now have. So Jordan's point is absolutely right. Yeah, the fans, the audiences, should just expect a seamless way to be suggested a new track, shared by a friend, and just be able to play that there and then. They don't care whether Facebook gets on with Spotify or Apple, they don't care who owns what platform, Facebook owns Instagram, whatever. They just care about getting to the music, getting to their artists as quick as possible. So it's our job within the industry to try and reduce that friction um, but you know there can be some challenges there because these are big companies that are quite competitive but yeah and I feel like you you guys have done it really with like Instagram stories incorporating the song link you click on it goes straight to Spotify so on so on so it's pretty much there and I'm, I'm riffing now because I've got a question do, do you think that you mentioned that point around songs getting shorter attention spans getting shorter is the quality of music declining and what or how much could we attribute that to, um, to social music? I just think... Social media, sorry. You can say yes, but I think at the same time, we as an audience want different things. Mm. You know what I mean? So people may say music's falling off, but back in the day, that's what people wanted from music. Now it's so disposable and so quick. Sometimes you just want your mood lifted. You want to hear that song that's just the same word repeated five times yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean the yeah. beat's banging you're like yeah I'm going to the gym <laughs> and then might, you might want to listen to some J. Cole and actually think about it but mm. there's moments in life for everything so yeah okay we'll we're open up for questions but I wanted to try and get like a, a closing comment from you all to answer the question basically do you think social media is killing the music industry I'm going to try and hold you to a yes or no I, I, I don't know We'll start with Darren. We'll work our way down. <laughs> we had to, it's, your, it's your house. This is your house, man. You Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> can I say a little bit more than a one word? Yeah, 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 and course, it was just yeah. kind of related to... Um, so I was looking around and I, and I was kind of, you know, disturbed by the fact I'm probably the oldest person in the room, which <laughs> is kind of quite scary for me. Um, and, um, but, but if you think historically, so there's a really interesting point on the, like, the compression of you know, the, the length of tracks mm. because, because of the technology. Uh, and actually, um, we think things are brand new. We think trends, are social media is kind of new and something that has never happened before. But if you look historically, you see precedents for the same thing kind of cyclically. Um, so if you look at the advent of rock and roll, for example, um, the tracks were no longer than two minutes, right? and that was because they were played um, on the radio primarily in the US before it kind of went global. Um, and that was like bite-sized, um, you know, very quickly turned over pieces of music. In fact, there was a lot of it was just kind of, you know, <coughs> blues material that was just being reworked into, you know, short form singles uh, that could be played on, on the radio. Um, so, you know, on the subject of, you know, is a social media made tracks shorter? Well, radio made them super short, mm. you know, 70, 80 years ago at the advent of rock and roll. So um, so I would say, you know, um, no is my answer to that question as we sit as a Facebook employee sat within this room. But, <laughs> but actually, don't, don't, don't take my word for it. Um, look historically at the precedents that we see. And, we, you know, we're still actually pretty early on in this thing that we call, you know, music, you know, called pop music, popular music. Um, and this is just the next episode for me. Ria? Yeah, I'd also say no. Um, nothing is killing the music industry right now. The major labels are enjoying extremely healthy profits. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with social media, it's just, it's a tool and you just need to use it carefully. You need to know how to use it. And, you know, like mobile phones, these things are fairly new in terms of the human existence and we just have to learn how to use them in a healthy way. Um, I think no, social media is not killing the music industry. I think though that I think we should learn how to use it. In, in I, I think we can do so much on it and I don't think that everyone actually takes time to figure out exactly what we can do on every platform. I think that there's a lot of like, younger people as well that for example iTunes might not be a, like very well known for you but so there's things on there that you can do in comparison to Spotify and I think it's just about educating ourselves and everyone around us, I think, to use it properly? Um, I think it's a double-edged sword, but I'd mainly say it's not killing the industry because 
it's given the artists more control. We have like direct accessibility to our fan base. And I feel like it's it's changing the music industry. It's making people see further than just selling records. It's about being a brand, being more than music, developing different ways of kind of gaining a fan base. So yeah. Okay. Um if everyone give a quick round of applause for the panel. <laughs> so we we got about like 10, 15 minutes for questions from the audience. I've got this weird microphone thing. I'm just going to throw it at people. <laughs> and then once you've caught it, ask your question and then throw it to the next person. I, I won't throw it to you. It's too close to throw it. I want to test my aim. Um, <laughs> who, anyone? Whoa, that's a mad aim. Okay, I'm going to go to you, yeah? Oh, hello. Um, I just had a question. Oh, thank you for all your um, discussions and things about the live music industry and whether social media is making it a more lazy resource for people to kind of watch gigs from home, watch gigs from their kind of sofas rather than actually going to the music venue. Because obviously ticket prices are rising, festival prices are rising, you know, there's almost that lack of interaction sometimes because my joy is going to a live music venue and actually seeing the artist. And I just wondered whether you have any thoughts on that. Um, like my opinion is, I. I kind of agree with what you're saying, but I don't really like the aspect of people actually going to shows and all you see is phones, you know what I mean? Mm. It's kind of ruined the real life aspect and now it's about, I'm going to that show to show my friends that I was at the show. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not, I'm going to the show to watch. Sure, yeah. It's, I'm going to the show to stunt on my friends. <laughs> I'm at the little, little Wayne show, I'm at the little baby show, yeah. Look, you're not here, ha ha. So that's kind of how I feel like it's not killing it, it's changing it. Because realistically, you're sharing it with your with community, community that would never maybe have even seen that. So it's a good it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Mainly mainly good. Yeah, I mean I might just add in there, so so you're in the home of VR Oculus Rift in this building. Um so I, I think that's a really exciting aspect of uh, of live performance in the sense that you see it in other industries. So theatre, for example, is coming out of, you know, that very exclusive environment that is West End theatre and coming into cinemas. Uh, so I think we see more of that, sort of the democratisation of being able to, you know, go to certain things. And I, th I think VR and uh, and online kind of supports in that. Um, you know, I don't, I mean, I, th I think the live um, event, the live gig, industry is live and kicking i think it's doing really really well the only thing that sort of concerns me a bit is is that you know that slight lack of democratization at the top end so the ticket prices are getting insane it's like you know premiership football and that for me so the, the numbers attending and sort of wanting that live experience doesn't concern me but who can attend mm -hmm. you know that that more concerns me you know um, and i think everyone should be able to have access to to live performance you know in the room live performance as well as hopefully the democratization of it through technology like like vr well if yeah if, if streaming got artists more money i'm sure that they will be able to reduce the ticket prices but we'll go to the next question so you're going to throw it i'm just going to direct you this dude here with the sunglasses uh, with the glasses <laughs> he's not wearing he's not stunning he's not wearing sunglasses i shouldn't have done that i've got to great sunglasses in my bag they're just still. glasses they're just glasses sorry dude thank you all for your insight um I just had a question relating back to earlier where you said about the line of sacrifice and exposure. Um, so do you have any examples, or can you explain an example, probably at, um, the people in the labels, um, of times where you've had to sort of reach a compromise with an artist that wasn't necessarily willing to expose something that was within the strategy of their marketing? Uh, no, I don't actually have any examples. I. I'm a big believer of only ever putting out what the artist wants. I think we can always have conversations about how to advise to do things better, or we can advise on how something may not particularly be the right way to go. But at the end of the day, I would never, and I hope I have never, <laughs> have done anything for an artist that shouldn't be out there or said something or put a voice or a picture or a story out. I think that's maybe kind of the old school way that record labels maybe used to work. I thought maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, record labels typically were like the devils. No one wanted to step near a record label. Even when I first got my major job, my major record label job, the amount of messages I got from people like, oh, you're going to the dark side now. And I was like, 
okay, it's not really like that because it's just people like us that work there now. Um, so for me, at a label, it's just about finding people who understand you. It's not about the label name or anything like that. It's about finding people and a team that can just help amplify what you do. No one's there to kind of sabotage you to make money. That's very much the kind of old school tales. I think they're still out there, though. <laughs> not me. 100%, um, 100%. If we go to there. the next question, if you throw... We'll work our way back to you. You're going to have the last question. That's a treat. <laughs> this guy here with the red cap, just be careful. I don't want any health and safety. Ooh. <laughs> you thank you. that, boy. Okay. Relax. <laughs> I tried, I tried, I tried. If you, hold, if you hold the mic up to your... If you hold the mic section up to your face, we'll make sure this, everyone yeah? can hear you. Yeah. That's a bit weird. Okay. Um, is there any particular campaigns where you felt like social media was used in the right way any particular campaigns that kind of stood out to you? Lewis Capaldi is doing a pretty good job right now, social media. Who's that, sorry? Lewis Capaldi. Blank. Blank. Sorry, I was like, I who's that, I sorry? Agree. I agree. Terrible moderator, terrible moderator. <laughs> Can you explain what he's doing? Can you explain what he's doing for the benefit of the audience? Sorry, Rianne. Can you explain what he's doing? Yeah, he's, he's very funny. Um, he has a very unique sense of humour and he is um, just, yeah, yeah. Advert he's, he's yeah. doing a job yeah, 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 yeah. I feel bad portraying that online um, and building up a huge follower account, I think, mm. because of it. Does anyone know Rich V2? Yeah. yeah. Like the Red Balloons, the FR32 campaign? I think that was a good use of social media for him. That kind of travelled and it was, the Red Balloon was everywhere. I think, kind of online and in the real world. And it was, everyone was like, what's the balloon about? But it all related back to the album. Um, so I think that was a good example of how it can spread using like his community around him. And then it just went further because people just wanted to know what this was. And I think that's the key thing about social media. It's like how to, get, how to use your audience around you, but then how to use them to kind of spread it further. What, one more example, if anyone's got one for this guy. I haven't got one. <laughs> I've got, um, maybe th there's a great sort of... Um, that's kind of great personality outreach. So maybe I'd go one a bit more on the creative side. So I uh, was going back a little bit now, but the weekend's um, latest album um, just did a really just hit that um, that sweet spot as as Instagram stories was really starting to explode. And uh, yeah, the label came to us with you know let's say sort of the standard approach for in the standard um, visuals for launching an artist. Um, we got we worked really closely with them to generate yeah just some really exciting different sort of challenging kind of beautiful visuals um that were just really visually impactful uh, on instagram stories that got you sort of interested you kind of clicked and then ha heard the music so i think uh, just pure creativity sometimes can can work really well as well as the um you know the kind of personality led approach as well okay if you chuck the mic any more any more questions to this dude who is wearing sunglasses so i am correct <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh, okay, cool. Um, so I just wanted to pick up on something Tasha said earlier. Um, you said major labels are doing fantastically well at the moment, which is definitely not true. Which is definitely true. Sorry, not a lie. I think. Uh, I'm <laughs> not going to lie. I think Rian. I think Rian said that. Was it Rian? I apologize. I'm at the back. I can't see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, the the point. Um, what I wanted to figure out. <laughs> what I wanted to figure out is. What is it that I guess independent labels can also do to capitalize on that success? Because it's it's not just limited to the big guys at the moment, is it? No, I think the beauty at the moment is that there's not just the record labels doing well. There's so many different types of labels and deals you can get. Um, obviously, the major record label is like the 360 deal. You kind of have everything included and your marketing and blah, blah, blah. But then you also can get just like distribution deals. Um, so like a Skepta or a Stormzy, before the kind of the deals, they were always going through like distribution labels. And so they would help actually get your music out to the DSPs and whatever, but you might have more kind of creative input. So I think it's, I think overall the music industry is doing really well. And obviously Jordan's from the indie side as well. I think, short answer, I feel like every kind of area is thriving in its own way. Cause I feel like everyone's now getting to know what everyone's doing and trying to just Take Rian, it. Jordan, yeah. is, is everyone winning? I think um, we're in a good place because these corporations like the Facebooks and major labels and brands are starting to realise that the worth of the grassroots artist and mm -hmm. 
realize how much impact somebody that isn't supported by a major can actually have on the world. So a lot of brands are supporting these artists that aren't signed and there's different ways in which you can make money and succeed and be seen without just having to sign deals. So I think it's 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 a good space and get better, but it's good. It's good, it's good, it's good, definitely. Okay, next question. I think we've got time for a couple more. Shit, sorry, that's my phone. Uh, Loic. Hello. Um, so with what's happened recently with Alex Mann at Glastonbury, uh, I wanted to know from a, an artist's perspective and a record lab label's perspective, um, he's come up really quickly, and I've seen up-and-coming artists saying that it's not fair, how's he got a record deal, how's he been on TV? Is it a case that as an artist or anyone, you take advantage of the social f media platform that you have? Or is it a case that right now, anyone's just buying anything that's hype or listening to anything that's hype? I, I think you can't run away from like, I would say like freak accidents that happen like that. <laughs> There's always stuff that happens like that in time and you just got to run with it. You can't say to him, don't sign a deal because you shouldn't. He should take that as far as he can take it realistically. There's always going to be moments that happen that just explode and people draw to mm. and I think you just take it yeah I feel like these things have happened way before social media yeah like the cheeky girls and Mr Blobby yeah yeah and yeah. do you know what I mean like this stuff's happened forever look at um Ferdy why are you coming first like yeah. these things just happen because I uh, guess social media but these things travel I think obviously as music fans first and foremost it does kind of irritate us a little bit when these things happen because you want people who are really like kind of about it for like the right reasons to win. But at the end of the day, I don't yeah. think we can stop that stuff happening. And there's different genres of music. We can pick what we want to listen to realistically. We are the like masters of what we want. It's like a diet. You just choose what you want to eat or listen to. It's up to you. If you want to listen to Ferdy, psh, <laughs> do, do your thing. If you don't, boy, <laughs> literally. We got, we got two more questions. Well, wait, one more. I'm being told one more question. And I promise you the question. So, sorry. I'm sure that you can grab the panel guys at the back. Look, if you chuck it to the front. Mind my face, mind my face. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my question... If you're um, speaking to the mic, because the people at the back won't be able to hear you. All right. Uh, okay, so I love discovering new artists. I think when you work in the music industry, that's like such a, uh, you know, it's so vital to do so. But um, with social media... Um, there's like an influx of singers, rappers, etc., and it seems like everyone kind of wants to be that. Um, so I think mainly from a record label perspective, but also open um, open to all of you. Um, what makes an artist um, kind of stand out and uh, remain kind of original and uh, keep that authentic authenticity um, intact? Oh, that's always the worst question because it's really hard to answer. Um, firstly, obviously, every single a &R, every single person likes something different. So they'll look for something different. I think just for me, if I like literally just from my own opinion, I would say to artists to just make sure you have created your brand and made your brand so strong and it's kind of just working and it's running and it's doing its own thing. And you don't need the help of anyone else because I think speaking from a label side that's exciting to see when whatever you're doing is working whether that's your social media account working or whether that's you're selling out shows in your hometown selling out shows could be selling out a capacity of 50 venues you could have 50 people in brighton 50 people in london 50 people in paris even um but if we see that you guys can do that on your own then it's like ah like we can like how can we help amplify that to the world now um i think a lot of artists kind of can sometimes come with like that entitlement like hey I'm a good singer or I'm a good rapper like sign me but then it's like but who are you what do you represent what kind of artist are you I should be able to know that by listening to your music searching you online talking to people about you speaking to someone that's gone to your show so I feel like just working on yourself and kind of putting it out as much as you can on your own and using people around you and using the platforms around you because they're so readily available for anyone to use now I think that will kind of make you stand out I don't think we've got any more time, unfortunately. So thanks. Another big thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, we've got the room for another 45 minutes. I think they're going to bring some dessert out if I'm not corrected. Our, 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 our vodka London. That got them going. Oh, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> our vodka London are going to be providing some alcohol and some drinks for you all. Um, and if you want to check out our vodka London, there, uh, vodka and gin distillery, based in Hackney. Um, we're throwing a party on the third of August. If you want to come through, we left some Shh. tickets on your on your desk. Hey, shut the fuck up. <laughs> How about that? Um, we're throwing a party on the third of August. Uh, if you want to come through, it's Jollof and Jerk. We left some seats, uh, some tickets on your seats, and come through. But thank you very much for everyone attending. Thank you to Blackout for having us as well.